senior baseball writer at The <laughs> Athletic, MLB Network's own, and as he says on his Twitter handle, which I follow at, at Jason ST, proud winner of the Spink Award in 2019, which is at the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum for those who write about the sport, which he does expertly. Jason Stark back here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you doing, Jason? Rich, I'm great, man. How are you? I'm sure you're great. I mean, what a relief this is. I mean, the nuclear winter is over. And I uh, I couldn't be happier for you and everyone else who writes about this sport and loves it so much. So great. Yeah, yeah. Relief really describes it for me too. I, I've seen the other side of that cliff that they almost went over. Don't like the view. Uh, it, it would have, it would not have been a pretty ravine to tumble down because it's a long way back up. So I'm so grateful that they figured out a way to get this done. Grateful that they're going to play 162 and hopeful that they mitigated at least some of the damage they were about to do to their sport. So wh- what did take us out of the abyss? What happened? Because it didn't seem like it was getting there. What happened, <laughs> Jason? It, yeah, it, like this was a really strange week because, it, you know, the odd thing about this, Rich, is like all the stuff that kept them apart for three months, they had pretty much worked out. Coming into this week, you know, they were so close on the really important stuff, the, uh, the, the tax thresholds, minimum salary, this, this bonus pool for young players. And then like, it almost felt like Congress where you work out all the stuff you argue about and then you find something else to fight about. So they wound up at this incredible fight over the international draft. And that was mind blowing to me because like, look, you know, the, there are abuses of the international market. There's no doubt about that. And it's been a problem for years. It was a problem five years ago. It was a problem 10 years ago. It was a problem 20 years ago. It was a problem 30 years ago. It, was, it did not become a problem this week that should have held up this labor deal. And because the relationship between the two sides has been so uncomfortable for so long, it almost did blow this up. But luckily... Uh, sanity prevailed. I think that's the best way to describe it. So um, let's just try and put it, because again, I, I've spared my listenership and viewership the fight, you know? Like, let's not yeah. argue in front of the kids type thing. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I didn't get into the minutiae, but I'd like to give uh, the listenership and viewership of this show, Jason Stark, a little bit of an idea of what's just been hammered out and how it might change things. So let's just start with the plain brass tacks of if I'm a fan of, say, the uh, Florida Marlins, the Miami Marlins, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm still old school, or the Pittsburgh Pirates or a team that doesn't spend and you're frustrated and, and, and will this new deal in any way, shape or form make things more uh, palatable for those fans that will it force these owners to spend in a way in which they haven't before? Jason? Yeah, that's a really fascinating question. And I would say the answer is no. Um, you know, I, I wrote a big piece in the athletic last night that you find it on our site today that looked at the impact of the various things they tried to do to promote more spending, to theoretically promote more competitive balance. But here's the flaw in the quote unquote competitive balance tax, which we used to call the luxury tax. Say so the good news for the players is the thresholds went up $20 million. And so for teams at the top, that's a relief, right? They can spend that money. There's, there's virtually no incentive for the teams you mentioned, the teams at the bottom of the payroll barrel, the Marlins, the Pirates, you, you know, the, the collection to spend. Uh, there was talk really early on of some sort of reverse luxury tax so that you would get taxed if you stayed under a certain payroll, just the way you get taxed if you go above a certain payroll. That died so fast. To me, that would have been much more effective than the other stuff they did. Uh, the, the, the one thing that directly impacts teams that lose is the draft lottery, and that was done to try to address – tanking but like are you aware of the nba <laughs> Who, who's had the the lottery longer than the nba has it stopped tanking in that sport it hasn't so i'm really dubious that 
we come out of a labor deal with anything that really fundamentally addresses what you just talked about. So what are the changes that we're going to see? Um, universal DH, right? That the pitchers hitting in the, in the yep. National League are, are finally after, you know, since the Revolutionary War, it's finally over, right? Is that what you're <laughs> Is that it, Jason, pretty much? Uh, well, there is a guy named Otani. I'm pretty sure they'll let him hit. <laughs> but, yes. But, right. but, Rich, hang on to your memories of that Bartolo Colon homer. Because we just won't see the likes of that again, you know. And that, that, like, that saddens me as somebody who loves like the fun and the weirdness of the sport. But I get it; pitchers can't hit, and so all the strategy that people used to dream on and talk about, like that's been going away anyway. In the age of, of of analytics and data and really sophisticated information, so like it all makes sense from that level. Um, what, what's actually I think very impactful that people haven't talked about a lot is rule changes in the future. Yes. Um, you know, there's a provision in there that basically allows them, not this season, but next season, to do some really important stuff. Pitch clock so the game has better rhythm. Don't know exactly how many seconds will be part of that pitch clock mm-hmm. yet, but that's important, don't you think? And uh, some, i, I got to be honest of, with you, Jason. The pitch clock to me – uh, I don't, again, again, I'm 52, okay? And the pace doesn't bother me. What bothers me the most is the strike, walk, I mean, the strikeout, base on balls, home run. That's the, it just, it just makes it so damn boring. Somebody throws 99 million miles an hour that comes in in the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth. So you don't have to have a starting pitcher. There's an opener, not a starter. And nobody gets on base because these guys are so tough to hit and everybody's positioned and bunched up exactly where you know somebody's going to hit it. And now I'm hearing people saying, well, they should just bunt their way on. And I'm not taking my 11-year-old and 13-year-old kid to Dodger Stadium to watch Max Muncy bunt his way on. You know what I'm saying? And <laughs> I, But I'm also not there to see him either strike out, walk, or hit a home run. Um, that's the rule changes I want. That's what yeah, I'm that, looking for. You know? Yeah, the, the, look, I think the game needs more action. Uh, has great athletes. Let them show how athletic right. they are. And, and the game needs better rhythm. And maybe those things can go hand in hand. Uh, the other big rule that's going to take, uh, be implemented in 2023 is some sort of limits on shifts. I'm sure that you'll see no more infielders in the outfield. And you'll probably see two infielders on each side of second base. And I, I think that, that's probably not going to have as big an impact as people think, but um, it'll have some. Like the average team, you know how many singles every game the average team now hits? Five, five singles a game. It's so there's crazy. never anybody on first base. Right? So you can't have any base stealing. You give you know you have minimal base running. It, every time the ball is hit, it's an extra base hit. That's the goal now. So maybe this will create more incentive for guys to actually just hit a single. And back to the pitch clock, real quickly. There was sure. one tried out, very aggressive pitch clock, 15 seconds in what used to be the California League last year. And it didn't just produce better rhythm. There were there was more action. The strikeouts went down. Right, walks went down. Um, there were more base runners, and more to watch. The game was more entertaining. It was fun to watch. Uh, I, it's really encouraging whether we can get to that in the big leagues. <laughs> I'll believe it when I see it. But I do think this is the beginning of a process that hopefully will make the game more entertaining in its current version. Well, in terms of the shift, Jason, I've been tilting at that windmill from this table and this desk, this microphone for quite some time. I I, I want to make sure that, let's just say, um, when uh, I, I'm watching uh, the Yanks and from last year, Rizzo 
lace one into right field and I'm a 52 year old man and for the first 50 years of my life I knew that was a base hit that was going to find space in in right field and instead the opposing team's third baseman is positioned out there in short right field and he just grabs it easily on the line and trots into the dugout to end the rally and I want to make sure that's over so when you say nobody in the outfield are you going to see like another line in the outfield but after uh, uh, you know beyond which somebody who is booked in the lineup as an infielder is not allowed to tread into that space prior to a pitch? Is that what you're saying? Well, yes. They had this great invention called infield dirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, no, so that, that's, 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 that will be the point of demarcation? That's where yes. it will be? No, no infielder can set up before the pitch in the outfield. And this was, this is a rule that was tried – in double-A leagues last year, and the results were really interesting. Um, you know, just having two infielders on each side of second base did not turn that bullet up the middle into a, into a hit because there's still somebody standing right behind second base. Right. But keeping infielders out of the outfield, that worked. The average on line drives that cleared the infield went up by 50%. There were 50% more hits on balls like that. And so to me, that's a step in the right direction. And just in the big picture, um, baseball negotiated the right to do what the other sports do. If you think the rules aren't working, the sport has the right to change them without negotiating for years and years and years and years with players who are always going to be split, pitchers, versus hitters on everything you propose. And so like just like the NFL looks at the product and says, we want more passing, we want more points, we want to protect quarterbacks. Right. Um, baseball will be able to do that in the future starting next year. And I think that's really important. So when you say starting next year, it's this new competition committee that gets together. So they're going to have to talk about it and then, and then have a vote on it. So 2024 is when we might see this sort of change is what you're well, saying? The three things that will happen in 2023 that we know are shift, pitch clock, larger bases, which are both a safety thing and actually do promote base stealing. Then any rule change beyond that, um, it can come out of this competition committee, but the committee is made, well, while it, in, it will include active players and an active umpire, uh, the majority of the members of the committee represent Major League Baseball. And so basically, the sport will finally have the authority to do what it thinks needs to be done. So all this stuff that Theo Epstein's been working on behind the scenes, like he can actually make some of that come to life if they think it's got a chance to work. It's Please tell me the fine print says any active umpire, not Angel Hernandez, though. Please tell me that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. Okay, just I'm going to make sure. All right. Um, so, real quick hitters uh, with you, Jason Stark, before I send you on into uh, this good Friday here. Um, the new playoffs, what does that look like? What is that? Uh, one extra wild card team in each league, and instead of a one game, it becomes a best of three. So, here's the way it works it's very NFL like. Uh, top two records in each league get a bye. Yep. Then. That first round is division winner, the third the division winner with the third best record and a wild card with the best record among the wild card teams host all three games versus the, the two remaining wild cards. And that so that the idea is that'll go quick. And those are three and game those are three game three sets. Three games, best of three game series. And again, no it's the two best day, it's no was, road games. Okay, so it's two best it's two best division winners, right? Because it, it, not not best records, because that would mean the Dodgers and Giants yeah, of this past right. year, right, would have gotten. You're, you're, you're correct. Okay, two the division winners with the two best records. Okay. But unlike last year, the Dodgers would host all three games of that wild card round because they have the best record of all the wild card teams. Okay, so there's no road. Everybody's just staying there. It's like a three game set. Yeah. Right. Like it's three games in three days in a row. No, don't no off days. Right. That's exactly right. Okay. Yep. That's the first round. And then the, the, the better 
seed uh, uh, of either one of those faces the the same seeds one two right in the they, next round? Well, no. You know, this is interesting. They're not going to reseed. So, um, the number one seed plays the winner of the three versus six series. Okay. Right, or rather, the yeah, the three versus. No, well, four. I guess if the six comes but, out, yeah, the it, four it, versus it, five series. Right. Oh, okay. That's interesting because if it was the NFL, whoever the lowest seed is coming out would go to the one, and then right. the the next one would go to the two. So yes. All right. Um, okay. And then so on and so forth till we have a, a World Series champion. Um, what about umpiring and 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 um, getting them to be robots? Is there any <laughs> conversation about that? Uh, there was a lot of conversation about uh, electronic ball strike. And I, look, we're going to have that at some point. Um, this is one of those rule changes that you might look for in 2024. Um, baseball is experimenting with this now at the highest levels of the minor leagues this year. And what does that tell you? It tells you this is going to happen in the big leagues once they get the technology to where it needs to be. And then the other thing is, you need to readjust the definition of the strike zone because I've seen this thing in action and the robot thinks balls are strikes that literally no one else in the entire stadium oh boy. thinks is a strike. Oh, boy. So you got to fix that part. Oh, boy. Before I let you go then, free agency. Freddie Freeman's uh, on the move. What do you think? That's the biggest name that's out there that, still? That I mean, people talk about Carlos Correa. I am obsessed with the Freddie Freeman watch. Me too. Um, you know, everybody has thought for how long that it is a foregone conclusion that he was going back to Atlanta. Maybe I missed something. If it was a foregone conclusion, wouldn't he be heading for Braves camp right now? They should have signed him last spring. Did they do that? No. Should, could have signed him during the summer? Didn't do that. Could have signed him when they had an exclusive, exclusive negotiating window after the World Series. Didn't do that. Could have signed him right before the lockout, like a billion other free agents. Didn't do that. And it's just hard not to believe that every day that went by when this didn't happen didn't make it more of a possibility that he goes to the Dodgers or somewhere else. I'll still kind of believe it when I see it, but this is far from impossible. Okay. So, um, and where, what is the Correa conversation i already saw stroman tweeted him go to uh, let's go to wrigley you know so i already saw that i checked that one out yesterday i'd watch for that um but he you know he changed agents in the middle of the lockout and he's now a scott boris guy Uh for 340 million dollars um i don't see the 340 million dollar match for him but the cubs are a perfect fit i don't see him going back to houston i don't see him doing a short deal um, the Cubs have signaled they're not in this to do a long rebuild. So just, I, I would keep your eye on them, even though like that's not likely to happen. But again, far from impossible to happen. Jason Stark, thank you for the time. I know you're a busy man. Lots, lots of news popping. Um, let's play ball. I'm so excited. We'll do this again. I just love to talk to you. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks again. That's Jason Stark, MLB Network reporter. The Athletic Senior Baseball Writer. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here. 